is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. We'll take the paper box scores that people are throwing into the trash and we're going to consolidate those. We're going to clean them. Whatever we can do to make sure that the data is accurate, we're going to do that first and foremost. And then we're going to put them into a big database. And then we've built basketball tools for basketball people. Ed Chow is the VP of Operations at Cerebro Sports, where they have the vastest collection of basketball box scores in the world, especially in the youth space. Cerebro organizes these box scores into basketball tools for basketball people, while partnering with event operators around the country, as well as vendors who stream youth basketball or do video breakdowns. Ed earned his bachelor's degree from Rice University in Houston and went on to earn a master's degree in public health from Emory University, focusing on epidemiology. In 2010, Ed launched his first startup, My Vaccines, a web-based tool that provided information and services to assist families in forecasting and managing their immunization records. After moving back to Houston in 2014, Ed launched Houston Escape Room, the first escape room concept brought to Texas that currently has two Houston locations. Ed, a self-proclaimed basketball junkie and longtime pickup game player, started Hoop Club Dallas, a digital solution to organizing pickup basketball games, which he later sold. The program's $10 games provided a no-drama way to play and attracted players at all skill levels, including NBA players like Trey Young. Hey, Hoopheads, I wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Hi, this is Gannon Baker, and you're listening to the Hoopheads podcast. Prepare like the pros with the all-new FastDraw and Fast Scout. FastDraw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years. You'll quickly see why Fast Model Sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there. For a limited time, Fast Model is offering Hoopheads listeners 15% off FastDraw and Fast Scout. Just use the code HHP15 at checkout to grab your discount, and you'll be on your way to more efficient game prep and improve communication with your team. Fast Model also has new coaching content every week on its blog, plus play and drill diagrams on its play bank. Check out the links in the show notes for more. Fast Model Sports is the best in basketball. Make sure you have your notebook ready as you listen to this episode with Ed Chow, VP of Operations at Cerebro Sports. Hello and welcome to the Hoopheads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel tonight. And we are pleased to welcome to the podcast Ed Chow from Cerebro Sports. Ed, welcome to the Hoopheads Pod. Hey guys, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. We are excited, Ed, to have you on and dive into all the various things that you've been able to do with the game of basketball. We're going to talk some pickup hoops, which is always one of my favorite topics Let's start by going back in time to when you were a kid. Tell us about some of your first experiences with the game of basketball. Uh, for sure. As a kid, um, you know, playing in the driveway with my little brother. I uh, never let him win one game ever, as far as I can remember. Nice work. Um, yeah. Uh, and to this day, I'm 38. He's 36. I still don't think it's happened. Um, but, you know, I was, I was the kid who memorized jersey numbers. You know, and family members would quiz me uh, to test test my my knowledge, and that's basically how I just started to to fall in love with with the players of the game and, and to know who was who. Um, and played in the backyard. Um, whoever came by, I would I would challenge them to a game of horse, and that love of basketball just um, just stayed with me. Um, and I never got a chance to play in high school. I was never good enough to play on the, on the high school team or anything like that. I was more of a tennis tennis kid. But um, once I made it to college and, and found intramurals and pick up, I, uh, it was hard to get me out of the gym. All right, so two questions. Okay. Growing up, who's your player? Who was your, who was your basketball player? 
growing up, it was MJ. I'm a, I was born in 84. So that was, I mean, the whole Bulls team, uh, that whole era, um, Horace Grant, for some reason, was one of my favorites as well. All right. Give me your, give me your, give me, your, give me your Jordan greatest of all time speech. Oh my God! Oh, I, I am, I am not one to be able to, uh, to really, I think, truly articulate his greatness. Um, but from, from my, from my little, uh, from my little vantage point, um, you know, just, just the, the killer instinct. Um, to step on people's throats uh, wasn't something that I had in my life and was always just enthralling. Um, and so, yeah, I can't say that was something that, that I aspired to, but I definitely respected it, <laughs> if, that's a, if that's an okay way to put it. I don't, I don't know. No, that makes a ton of sense. I love these conversations. I've been, ever since I was a kid, Jordan has always been it for me. I spent so much of my childhood slash young adulthood watching Michael Jordan. And I think I was a North Carolina fan before pre-Jordan, maybe because of the colors. I'm not sure why. Loved Al Wood. But Jordan cemented that love of North Carolina basketball for me and then continuing to watch him in the pros. And for me, I think you call it killer instinct. What I always love to say is, I've never watched any other athlete where I felt like the result was just inevitable, that he was going to figure out a way to win. And when he did, I was never surprised. It was more just a confirmation of the fact that I didn't know how he was going to do it. I didn't know exactly what it was going to look like, but you just knew that somehow, some way, he was going to get it done. And then in those rare instances, whether it was early in his career or later on when he would lose a game or maybe not come through in a big moment, you were so surprised. And yet he almost always, even if even in defeat, he, he, he was always the best player on the floor. And I've just never seen anybody with that combination of physical talent, mental toughness and then just that feeling of inevitability that killer inst instinct that you described when people try to argue with lebron as the greatest player of all time or somebody else from the past you just if if you're arguing that i just don't see you, you didn't see you didn't see jordan live you didn't watch an experience watching michael jordan cuz if you did there was no way that you could ever say that the peak of Michael Jordan comparatively to any other player, to me, it just doesn't compare. Now, LeBron's going to put up an unbelievable counting statistics, and he's probably going to have the best basketball career when you look at the longevity piece of it, what he's been able to do, and he's phenomenal, but nobody compares to Jordan. Yeah, and at the time, as a kid growing up in Dallas, I can't say that I had a – I mean, I was a hometown fan, but um... – you know, outside of Jim Jackson, Jamal Mashburn, Jason Kidd, that that era or that that team, um, you know, it was just I wish. I mean, it's just Mike. It's just Mike every year. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot of of Dallas Mavericks basketball that was exciting to watch. I guess you had the I guess you had the Jason Kidd, Jimmy Jackson, Jamal Mashburn love triangle that sort of. <laughs> broke that broke right. broke that destroyed that team back in back in the day. Jimmy Jackson's a guy, he's an Ohio guy. Actually, I remember I went and saw heard about him and his high school team Toledo McCumber was playing probably in a, a school that was maybe a half hour 35 minutes from me and my dad and I went and saw him in 10th grade and of course this is pre-internet so yeah, we had no idea what he looked like or anything. So we just show up in the gym and he was a sophomore at the time and came running out for warm-ups and you're like, oh yeah, that's Jimmy Jackson and looked probably exactly the same as he did the day he showed up for the Dallas Mavericks, just was, had an NBA body in 10th grade and just was one of those, uh, like I've seen him and LeBron are the two high school players that had no business being on a high school floor. They were just built differently and just incredible. So yeah, I can, I can see where 
you you might you might spend your time rooting for Jordan as opposed to rooting for those Mavs teams. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. All right, so my second question about what you said, tennis, who's your tennis player? You know, I didn't really love watching tennis growing up. Um but I guess if I had to pick one, um I'd have to pick Michael Chang. Um, okay. You know, just just to be able to see someone else who looked like me out there. Um and uh you know, he was he was a little bit shorter. Um and still was able to to make make a pretty good run at it, so rooted for him. But um, I would say favorite player, uh, Patrick Rafter. Okay. <laughs> Servant volley, Aussie. Yeah. Yep. Um, but I just didn't want to go with like a Pete Sampras or Andre Agassi. That's gotcha. the only reason. I understand. So you're a little younger than me because my guy when I was a kid was McEnroe. Totally different era, and it's funny because. My own personal personality, nothing at all like John McEnroe, which is probably why, <laughs> which is probably, why, which is probably why I love them. And I can remember being eight, nine years old, those early Wimbledon's where he was going against Borg and just wanting to stay home and get up on Sunday morning and, and watch those watch those tennis matches. It's it's funny just how your your viewing habits change and how you slowly but surely. You have to eliminate things as you get older and you get more responsibilities and tennis i just don't watch nearly as much as as i used to but when i was a kid and again even as an early adult i i would watch man i'd watch a lot of tennis it was one of those things that i love watching and michael chang i just remember him just going side to side baseline to baseline just being yeah. so so good at playing defensive tennis and at that time obviously his style was you know, you had a lot more serve and volley players back then mm-hmm. as opposed to guys that were now most everybody's playing off the baseline just because you can hit the ball so hard with the technology and the rackets and all that stuff. So it's it's a different it's a different era and tennis is has definitely evolved from from where it was back in back in the late seventies, early eighties when it was probably for me at least in my heyday of watching tennis for sure. Got it. Yeah. Well that's cool that you had that background. Yeah, for sure. All right. So tell me a little bit about your how does your love for technology come into play and then obviously we can talk about how you you mold your two loves together yeah you know i think instead of love or technology i would just say that entrepreneurship kind of runs in my blood um you know my dad is an entrepreneur and when he came to the states as an immigrant put his put himself through school and eventually you know got his accounting degree and um had his own business and i think as a kid watching him be able to have the flexibility to be able to to take me and my brother to, to tennis tournaments and just be, you know, be involved in our lives was just something that I didn't know what type of business like I would want to get into, but I just knew that that lifestyle was something that I, I really appreciated out of my dad. And so I think, I think entrepreneurship, um, you know, I've, I've, I've started and failed um, at a lot of different companies. Um, but if we ju- just jump kind of straight into, you know, maybe the last company that I started before joining Cerebro um, was this little organized pickup basketball company. I guess you could call it a company um, called Hoop Club here in Dallas, Texas. And um, we we basically partnered with parks and rec departments in the DFW Metroplex. There was probably about five different cities and we had a few private gyms um, here in DFW that we partnered with as well, where we would take their leftover time slots. You know, this is kind of like in the shared economy where, you know, you we would um, rent out the gym essentially from, you know, let's say like 6 to 8 p.m. On, on weekday nights when it's slow generally for these rec centers. And actually, it wasn't quite renting out as it was as a revenue split. And, and so they would give us these, these slots um, throughout the city and um, we would sell 15 tickets to each of these hoop club sessions. And you just sign up, you pay online, something between like 10 to $13, and you were guaranteed a spot in the game. And once you showed up at the gym, you know, we had a facilitator who would, uh, you know, kind of like welcome everybody and, and int- do some introductions just to make you feel welcome, if it's your first time especially. And, you know, make the teams, try to make them as balanced as we can just right off the bat. Um, and the... the you know, having 15 players is, is was the magic number for us because uh, you never would have to wait more than one game. And, you know, I think we all know if you go to LA Fitness or, you know, some open runs, good good pickup, like 
you know, there's just a lot of drama that comes with playing pickup yeah. basketball. And so the idea of organized pickup basketball always seemed like an oxymoron and always seemed like something that, you know, was so elusive. No one could ever crack the code on, on how to do that. And um, so anyway, that's that's how we kind of structured um, the the sessions. And we just found that, you know, it really, really, it really resonated uh, with the young working professional kind of demographic, you know, um, people who were just, you know, getting off work and just wanting to, to get a good run in sweat, you know, I mean, good competition for sure, but like, it's just about getting, getting some, some good runs in um, and not wanting to sit and meeting some people. We had a lot of people who, you know, like moved to Dallas or transient or come in for work and, you know, just wanted to meet some people, hoop. And that was, that was basically it. We just tried to, to, to provide a really, I don't know, hospitable environment uh, to make you feel welcome. And um, it just, it just kind of grew organically. And just at some point, it just felt like it was a little bit of a cult following that we had because you know we would just see how the same players going to play all over the city because they they just loved uh, the setup um, and the people that were a part of it so um, that's my quick little overview of what hoop club was and um, and what we were doing all right let's go back in time to the beginning where did the idea come from and what were some of the things that you thought heading into it would be the biggest challenges and then how did those compare to what the actual challenges were? So maybe the idea where to come from sure. and then what did you think it was going to be versus what it ended up being? Sure. So my wife and I spent about two years in New York city, um, in Manhattan. Um, let's say this is probably around 2010 and I'm sorry, probably a little bit after that, maybe like 2014. And when we were out there, um, she was traveling for work. She was a consultant. And I, I was just like, what do I do with myself in this, in this new city? I'm from the South, never, never lived in the Northeast. And I came across um, this, this pickup basketball service called Indoor Hoops. And it's, it's their model. And, and they would rent out you know, public school, like middle school gyms throughout the city and, and have this concept. And I basically just went around New York City playing basketball every night in different parts of New York City, getting to know the city in, in that way. Um, and so I thought that that concept was so brilliant, but I thought it might only work in the Northeast in New York City where it's, it's such a dense population. Um, and when we moved back to, to Texas, um, you know, with everything sprawled out, big box gyms, I just didn't, didn't know if, if there was a need um, for something like that here. And, you know, you, don't, you never know until you try. And so, you know, decided to, to at least give it a shot. And there was a, there was a local church here that, that gave me one night a week. Um, and, you know, the first session, I think, that we launched, I think, had six people. So we played three <laughs> on three. And then the next week had 10 people. So we played five on five. No one sat. And then the next week we had 15. And then after that, like, we had a wait list every time. Um, and so it was just pretty organic um you know the word spread and we just started filling that session up and needing to find more spots to play and um yeah that's pretty much how it happened were the facilities how challenging was it to make deals with the facilities now as you said you're trying to fill some of their time where they already know presumably that their facilities are empty or again, they're not being utilized to their fullest capacity at the times when you're signing up for them. But how, what were, what were the conversations like with facility owners and the people who are managing those places? <laughs> Great question. And that was definitely, you know, we, we had a really wide experience depending on if this is like a private facility, you know, um, high school gym versus, you know, park parks and rec gym. Um, and for the most part, um, you know, people, I would say it was 50 50 um, usually like hey no that's just that's not something that we're interested in um, when I tried to explain the concept and you know I get questions about like wait so it's it's different people every single week I said yeah we we don't know because it's different from a league I can't tell you it's just, like some of these places for liability reasons and liability insurance need to know that like hey I need a list of all the players who are coming every, every single 
every single week. And I'm like, uh, I can I can get them to sign a waiver for you on site that day, but I can't tell you who they are. And that's the same people every single time. And so that was a no deal. You know, that was that was basically a deal breaker for for some of these private facilities. Um, and so we definitely we definitely ran into you know a lot of hurdles, a lot of red tape. Um, but it wasn't really until we we found you know, work, working with the parks and rec department directly, um, being such a huge, um, adv- like win-win situation, to be honest. Like I didn't know how, how these rec centers normally work with their partners and their vendors to set up, you know, classes, but the, it's a really, I think a very fair model that they have in terms of revenue split, you know, like it, they take, they take a small cut of what you bring in to the facility and if you're a valued partner, like you can, you can make a good chunk of, of what you bring in. Um, and so once we had that relationship set up, you know, they, they pretty much, they couldn't give us more than two or three times a week, like each, any given facility, but they would right. guarantee us those slots because we would always fill them. Um, and for them, their quota wasn't necessarily the revenue that was being brought in, but being able to bring in, you know, a different demographic, like young working professionals going to a public rec center here in Dallas doesn't happen very often, but like to be able to provide programming for, for young adults was something that, um, a lot of these rec centers, once, once the supervisor kind of like was able to, to hear from the other supervisor that it was going well, then they would recommend, refer us and then we would get into their facility. And it was just, it was word of mouth, even across, you know, the facilities as much as it was across like the players. So, you know, it was, it was neat to be able to see, um, I don't know, even even the facilities rally around what we were doing and being excited and being, you know, sometimes even being asked to see if we would bring Hoop Club right. um, to them, which is definitely a tipping point for us. To be able to have them not just as a rental facility, but almost to be a partner, right, where they're encouraging and they're a part, they, they're feeling like they're a part of it. To me, I'm sure that's a valuable piece of, of that of that relationship. Definitely. Definitely. When I think about this and I think about myself as somebody who's played a lot of pickup basketball in my life, unfortunately not for not for a, <laughs> not for not for a number of years as an old guy with a torn ACL that never fixed it, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> anyway anyway, one of the things I guess I would look at and say, Well, man, if I'm gonna sign up for this thing, I wanna make sure that the level of play is if I'm a high level player, I wanna make sure that the level of play is high. Or if I'm a player who is just an average player. I want to make sure that I'm not showing up to a game where I'm going to have a bunch of former Division One players where I'm not going to be able to do anything out on the floor. So, how did you overcome that piece of it in terms of making sure that the level of player was similar, or did you find that the clientele that was signing up that that didn't matter as much as maybe I think it did? Yeah, to be honest, it was probably more the latter, and I, I, we were wrestled with that for a long time. You know, self. <laughs> Self-rating is not something yeah, that's, that, yeah, that's not good. <laughs> that, that works so well. And we never had a big enough contingent of, you know, I think high level players that we were able to kind of even craft like sessions that were just, you right. know, for, for ex college players and, and above. Um, and so, you know, we, we ended up just settling on, Hey, you know what, this is, this is 80, you know, we're going to serve like 80% of, of who we think is out, like 20, you know, like 80% of your revenue comes from like 20% of, of your customers. And, and so for us, it was just like, okay, these are, these are the people who keep coming back and, and they are your, you know, we've noticed like, like they were the guys who, and some girls who played high school, but never made it into college ball. Like though, that was kind of like our sweet spot, um, who played, you know, guys who played varsity, um, basketball, uh, maybe JV or even just some, some, you know, just casual rec play, but we didn't have a lot of like elite players coming in though. There were some that would come out and still have a really good time, but it's just, it's just kind of like what you're saying, like attitude and sort of like at a certain age, you're not, you're not still trying to make it. You're still not, you're not trying to make it anymore. And and if you've, if you've kind of like given up on that, that path (laughs) and you just, you're playing for the love of the game, then, then, then there's still a lot of people who would, there were a lot of guys who would still come out and, and hoop with us. So how much were you playing during this time? How many nights a week were you playing? <laughs> you know, I've, I had, let's see, my first kid pretty much like 
a year and a half into hoop club and so it slowed down dramatically you know and, and just <laughs> that's, trying to... that's surprising and i have no idea what you're talking about i can't uh, relate at all yeah it's uh it's i've already retired too um and um let's see probably by my mid-30s i was i was pretty much uh, moving on to uh to pickleball but you know for me it was it was just the opportunity to bring to build a community of of just like people who just love coming out there and you know growing up playing pickup you know i can't always say that i felt like i belonged on the court <laughs> um and whether it's just you know what i look like or i, I just you know it was never i you know was going to mistake mistake me for for an ex nba player or a college coach or whatever but um i knew that those like people who love playing basketball always called you know that space like a sanctuary and like you know a safe place and a haven and like i i didn't know what that felt like um and so i i almost built this company for myself in a way that i wanted like i i the mission at one point we kind of laid it out was you know if i can make you feel like you belong in the basketball court then i can make you feel like you belong somewhere in this world and that i think ethos you know the the metric uh, here's another kind of like way that i i looked at hoop club as a business was you know the metric that mattered to me during a session in terms of like if you asked me if, if this was a good hoop club session or not like this night i would i would have said it's based off of the number of high fives that were given between the players you know the 15 players that showed up that night and there was a few times that we would take a counter out there and we would just track that um, I think it was a stat that um, man the 2011 Dallas Mavericks the team that won the championship had where you know that team had more like high fived each other more than any other team in the NBA. Uh, I don't know if that I've I've just heard that I've never actually seen a number. I think there was a like stat that. too that Steve Nash right was mm-hmm. the guy that was the gave the highest number of touches whether that was high fives or slap on a butt or whatever it was. Yeah, that he was the guy in the league that most touched his teammates at some at some point during the seven seconds or less era. Yeah, I, I remember that as well. And it you know, it's just that that just stuck with me. Um, you know, something about like chemistry or just being able to like tell your teammate like good or bad, like I got you. Um, that you know, just sends that signal. You know, there's so many different messages you can send with a high five. And anyway, that that's just that's just kind of how I looked at um, you know, running these hoop club sessions. So it was like it was more important to me to like watch the dynamics between people and make sure that like, you know, like you're saying, even, even on a competitive level, I want you to be competing and playing hard, but I also want to be building like this community where like, we're all out here. We're on the same team. Like I know we're playing against each other, but like we're all young working adults, like for the most part. And we're out here trying to get better, trying to get a good exercise and um, building community. So that's, that was the ethos of, of hoop, hoop club. There is nothing better than pick up basketball when it comes to that feeling that you just described of fitting in, feeling like it's a sanctuary, having a community. And I think back to when I was playing and the number of times that you show up at a park and it, whether you're at a place where you are regularly or whether you go to a place that you've never been before, basketball is just it's a common language. And I think you said it really well when you talked about that you want to compete as hard as you can with people. And yet at the same time, you're all still kind of part of this community. And obviously you can go to some places where there's, <laughs> where there's more animosity <laughs> rather, rather than less, depending on what park you go to and when you're there. But for the most part, most of the places where I played pickup basketball, I definitely felt that piece of community and I've talked about this before but one of the things that I look back most fondly on in my basketball career and I was a high school basketball player and I played division one college basketball and I always say that some of my most fond memories of basketball weren't during those organized times but it's the time that I spent playing pickup basketball on the playground and back in the day when I was playing primarily a lot of the pickup that I played was outdoors I mean certainly there was some indoor that we played but played a lot of time outdoors and I remember the local park in my community was probably about a half mile bike ride from my house maybe a little less than that and from the time I was like 13 or 14 years old I'd hop on my bike and ride down to the park and I would always try to be the first person 
to the park so that as the players started showing up, by the time they got to 10, I was one of those first 10. And so I could always get into that first game and maybe I'd do something good and somebody would recognize me and then maybe I'd get a chance to play again later with some of the older guys and whatever. And there was, there was a guy that at the time we thought he was really old, but he was probably like 36, 37. He had gray hair <laughs> and he was a good player, but he would always show up and he and I would be the two first guy, the two people there. So the youngest, the youngest kid, and then the oldest guy who typically played in these games. And he and I would be the first two there. And we'd oftentimes, we'd just sit on the bench and we'd talk and, you know, he'd share things about, you know, about the game or, you know, kind of, I don't know if acted as my mentor as I didn't think of it at that time. And I'm not sure if, you know, if he did, but certainly like those conversations and just, I think about the adults that kind of put their arm around me and sort of helped me to be a part of that and said, Hey, we'll, we'll take this kid and we'll, we'll put him on our team. And just, there's no way to ever replace that. And I say all the time that my own kids who have grown up playing AAU basketball and playing travel basketball and playing with kids their own age and all these things that like, there's a lot of good stuff about that, but I feel like they got cheated out of some of the experiences that I got on the playground. It's just, it's a different way of growing up. And I I wouldn't trade that ability to have to play pickup basketball. My wife has often told me, it's funny that just thinking about what you were able to do here with hoop club, my wife has told me for years, she's like, you got to come up with something, bring back the pickup, bring back the pickup, bring back the pickup. (laughs) I'm like, I don't know. I'm not sure how you, how you do that. And here you, you had the, you had the, you had the blueprint all along. I just should have, you know, we should have, we should have met 10 years ago. And it's not too late. You can still, still run it back. You can still That's bring true. it back. Yep. Um, if there's a need in, in Cleveland, Ohio, let me know. It's yeah. it's not too bad to set it up. That's cool. I mean, it's fun. I think it's something that uh, is, is super interesting. Now, we were talking before the podcast that you ended up selling the business. So talk a little bit about, the, first of all, the decision to do that and then just a little bit of maybe what the what the new group that, that purchased it, what their, what their thoughts are and where they're headed with it. Sure, absolutely. So this it was during COVID that we pretty much had to freeze all operations um, for Hoop Club, and at the time I was, you know, had a this was this was a side hustle. It was just you know a passion of mine, um, and so it wasn't it wasn't something that I could keep going. And there was an interested party that you know a, a friend um, who I had met who who had been working on. Uh, more of more of a basketball league um, uh, app, and there was always a. It always seemed like it would fit well um, having having pickup as a lead gen um, to be able to feed and funnel players into a league, um, and so yeah, we just had some conversations and and we we came to an agreement, um, and I, I stayed on with this t- with this company. It's called Arena Sports, spelled with two E's, A R E E N A Sports. Um, also local here in Dallas, and uh, stayed on to just help them transition a little bit and, and try to grow um, their basketball leagues, uh, where we were sharing a lot of facilities. There was a lot of overlap in our players and our communities, so just try to try to go over there and, and, and try to bring them, um, you know, some of that continuity of of um, hoop club into into arena. So that was that was the big transition, kind of like moment was because of COVID and. You know, certainly could have picked it up later, but you know, just timing wise, it seemed to make sense. Um, and coincid, I don't want to say coincidentally, but um, one of my board members um, on Hoop Club um, had approached me about helping him with his company. Um, at the time, it was called ePlay, uh, which is now where where I am now. We've we've reformed the company into Cerebro, but um, uh, my CEO now, Ryan Gerardo, was on my board of directors for Hoop Club, and um, when when I had to freeze Hoop Club and decided to sell it, he said, "Ed, like with your experience of running event operations and and running a business like this, and also my background in um, statistics, like I have my degree in um, epidemiology, like just disease statistics. So being able to combine, um, you know, my." my skill set with my passion, um, he asked if I would be interested in helping him out with, uh, with ePlay. And when I took a look at, you know, what they were trying to build over here at ePlay, 
um, the mission really just jumped out at me. Um, you know, it was it was about helping players advocate for themselves with stats. And anyway, we can we can kind of unpack like, and 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 kind of like go over what Cerebro is. But but I'll just say like that's that was kind of like the hook that that made me really intrigued. And, and talking to my wife about it, it was like okay, like this is something that I, I'd like to be involved in. Obviously, anybody who is involved in basketball specifically, but sports in general, understands and knows that a lot of the conversations today center around analytics and what analytics can do on the coaching side, what it can do on the player evaluation side. There's just so many pieces to it. And I think there's just <clears throat> there's a ton of data that's out there that we're still trying to figure out again what can we do with it how can we make the game better whether that's from a coaching standpoint from an evaluation standpoint so you guys get involved in this you jump in and you start looking at it why don't we start with just give us an idea of what it is exactly that Cerebro does for people that are listening so we can kind of start to be able to educate them from a standpoint of sort of the baseline of what you guys do yeah and if you don't mind i just start with a little bit of a disclaimer because it, it's sure. hard not to I, I i know from what i've researched and looked into in terms of the hoop heads podcast audience you got a lot of high school coaches you have parents you have um you know people who who live in this world of of youth basketball aau grassroots scholastic basketball and, and and i'm an outsider very much so as if you've kind of heard over the past half an hour in terms of my background i've never played in grassroots basketball i've never played at the college level i've never coached and so you know i i think i i just say that i feel very much an imposter um <laughs> even though i've don't, been working don't feel that way because here honestly so here i'll, I'll give you I'll, I'll give you the i'll give you the honest and i appreciate i appreciate your honesty and your feelings there because I think one of the things that so as the host here like I haven't coached high school basketball since 2008 2009 and so one of the things that as I'm going through and I I think what you have to do is you have to kind of look at it and say I I'm like I'm humble enough to know that like I don't understand a ton of things in terms of just how the game has evolved and changed and coaching and this and that and just the, the way that when I the last time that I was coaching and watching film I was using a VCR so it's like you go back and now you see all the different things that we have and and look I thought I knew way more about the game when I was 23 than what I do now and so I think that as you go through and, and you're sharing what you guys are doing which I'm curious because I spent some time poking around the website and looking at the video and trying to figure it out and I think I have in my mind kind of what it is, but at the same time, do you I'm want not to go first? Sure. Do you no, want to no, go first? Maybe? No, no. I want you, you to. I, I'm no, curious to know what you, what you if, think already. Because if I start, because if I start, because if I start talking, <laughs> what's going to happen is everybody's going to be confused, and you're going to be like, "Boy, Mike, that was the worst sales pitch for Cerebro we've ever heard." So I'm going to let you go first, and then I'm going to pepper you with questions after you get through the baseline explanation? Well, offline, I'd, I'd love to, to still know the answer of what you thought before we talked because to me, sure. I want to learn. I want to know what someone thinks from just visiting websites, from seeing our marketing or whatever it is um, and, and the perception that you have. So um, here's one way that I, I like to describe Cerebro. I feel, I like to say that we're the custodians of the uh, grassroots basketball space. Um, I know you just said like it's crazy how much information, how much data is out there, for, you know, around basketball, and people are still trying to figure out how, you know, what to do with it, advanced analytics, etc. But I think when I came into this world, like two and a half, this grassroots basketball world, two and a half years ago, my first like realization was how chaotic little, how yeah. little there is. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're right. How little, you're right. How little you're data there right. is. Actually, yeah, you're hundred yeah. percent right. At this level. At the grassroots level, where you're talking about AAU basketball, yeah. or you're talking about youth community travel basketball, which, I mean, I don't even know how many participants there are. Yeah, there's there's next to nothing. Like you're lucky if you get a score sheet that has the player's number and 
how many points they've scored, and if you get the score right and who won the game. <laughs> so, so yes, I understand. Yes, yeah, okay. Understand. So that was the shock that I had when I came into this world, and and as I peeled back the layers, like it only got worse. <laughs> um, and but like I started to understand why. I started to to get on the ground and 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 to be you know with some of these event operators and and, and to see why, but. All of that to say, I call it, yeah, I call ourselves like the custodians because we're cleaning up, you know, we'll, we'll take the paper box scores that people are throwing into the trash and we're going to consolidate those. We're going to clean them. Like just make to sure like what whatever we can do to make sure that the data is accurate, we're going to do that first and foremost. And then we're going to put them into a, a big database and we put that, put it into this big database. And then, and then we've built basketball tools for basketball people. Like we've, like in any other industry where you can filter and, and, and find recruits and look for job applicants and better fits in, in a very similar way, we, we've we added, you know, filters um, to be able, for, you know, for you to, to look through an event in particular and look for, you know, you can sort by different fields or whatever you're interested in, look at different teams and do that at the AAE level. Um, and as we collect more and more of these box scores, you start to be able to build, like piece together player profiles and resumes like what kids are doing over time and we have to do it strategically because you can't boil the whole ocean at once and so we we came up with sort of a a a few different ways to to help us strategize like what events do we go to where do we go and and get these get the data and we have a kind of a player-led strategy and we have an event-led strategy where you know there's there's obviously your premier national events that happen around the country. You know, you got night. You know, you got the shoe circuits. You have flying to the hoop in Ohio. Um, you know, you have all of these like just, you know, Les Schwab and Portsmouth and City of Palms and you know the ones that have always been established. Um, so you have to get those. You know, if if they have you have those box where you got to get those. And then in terms of player led. Um, you know, just it's you start at the top of the pyramid and you make sure that, you know, let's just say ESPN top 100 rankings on t- class of 2024. Let's let's go make sure we have at least 50 games on every one of those players. And when we get those players, we're going to have their teammates. And when we have their teammates, we're going to have their opponents. So then it starts to trickle down a little bit. You might you might get a little bit, you know, at the next tier and then the next tier. But that's that's how we've sort of like at least guided ourselves in terms of like where to go get data so um hopefully that gives you at least a picture of of where we where we decided to start with um going to get the data first recognizing that there's just there is just a lack of box score data at the aa level and you know i started to understand that's because college coaches trust their eyes more than anything you know they they're still using the eye test and scouts you know um, scouts and they're and then you know maybe they're gonna they're gonna look at some film they're gonna go and you know watch the kid in person and then um, you know s- send out their their assistant coaches you know to different events and report back on Monday let's talk about it and then let's make a decision on who to offer but it was really telling for me when I was talking to a, a division one head coach and I asked him like on average for a recruit for a freshman recruit like how many box scores do you have to look at for that kid and he he said four and I, I, I couldn't really, I was like four, like, no, like there's no way. Like, he's, yeah. He's like, yeah. And he's, he actually spent a week forwarding me every single email he got from like people, like kids, um, international scouts and agents, like just trying to push their players to him. Like it was just, it was mind boggling. Like, you know, just the, the mixed tapes and, and what people thought were important to, to show. But like numbers were such a, you know, there just weren't number. A lot of times there weren't numbers or you couldn't trust the numbers. There wasn't context for the numbers. Um, and so, yeah, that was, this is just me continuing to try to learn and understand like what the pain points, what the problems are in this space, you know, before trying to honestly come up with a solution. But you know, I've already, I kind of already started to tell you like kind of solution wise where we went with, with the data collection and process. But the other part, like the other half of the equation here is that we needed a way to simplify the data. Even though it was like box score data, we we wanted a way to, to make it really, really fast and easy to digest big data. And so, um, I mean, my team, 
um, has been really, really amazing in educating me and showing me the ropes. And, and one thing that one of our one of our teammates did was to come up with our own composite score metric called uh, the RAM. You know, basically taking like your eight components of a box score and putting that into into one number. You know, and I would not be doing it justice if I tried to explain how it all worked. Um, but with this one number, you can pretty much rank. You know, let's just say every every player in the, in the NBA season last year. And in addition to that one metric, we also have um, the C ramp, the comparative metric, which tells you how good a player was relative to the average of the field. So then with, with that number, we were able to start to kind of like separate, kind of like percentile of, of a player. And then we started handing out quote unquote like medals, um, gold, silver, bronze medals, where, you know, in the NBA, there would be like 2%, 2% of the NBA would get medals and then like 5% would get silvers and then 12% would get bronzes. And you start to see these tiers of players start to kind of like, you know, um, organize themselves. And when you, and the reason that we stuck with just box score stats and nothing more complicated than that, even though, you know, in the NBA and you're looking at, I don't know, the PER or whatever advanced metrics that are out there, like that use, you know, like play by play data, you don't have that at the AAU level. Like you, you barely have box scores at times. So the only way to translate those this these numbers to the AAU level is to use like one common you know one common set of numbers so that's why we stuck with just the simple box score stats and so with those two metrics you have a way to very quickly just kind of like you know put I mean I hate to to, to say it this way like you know to assign a value to a player with one number like how much they're how good they are how much they're worth um, but it's a way to very quickly just organize that list um, so you have we have those two numbers. And then we have this separate set of five numbers that we call the five MS, and it's the five metric suite. And this is this is what tells you like the skill set that a player has. So we were able to take those eight eight box score metrics and organize them to kind of five skill set skill sets. If you don't mind, I'll just tell you those five really, really sure, quickly. Sure, go for it. You got pure scoring prowess, three point efficiency, floor general skills, around the rim like activity. And then um, defensive statistical impact. So these five um, numbers, they all scale to 100. And the reason we came up with these numbers, I'll give you a quick backstory on this, was actually inspired by Coach John Beeline, who's one of our uh, first investors. He he was telling us how it would be great to be able to like search through a data set by by the archetype of a player. So he gave us nine different archetypes. You know, like. The modern big, or the com- like, the point forward, or the combo guard. You know, he gave us nine of those, and we kind of came up with this five metric suite to be able to say, you know what, each of these nine archetypes, I can tell you, is a com- is a certain kind of minimum combination of these five skill sets. Like your point forward is gonna, it's gonna be really strong. Your floor general skills gonna have a really good, um, you know, strong defensive uh, defensive statistical impact, um, and you know, maybe their maybe their scoring isn't quite as high, but with with those five skill sets, we're now able to really really quickly sight read. You know, like you know, if I could pull up your um, your numbers uh, back at Kent State, like it would be really cool if I could if I could look at it with that would with be very cool. MS. It's 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 fun to, it's fun to go back and look at my statistics. Just <laughs> like it's funny because they have. You can look at like whatever the ref for college, but that's basketballreference.com or whatever. Mm-hmm. And somehow they have like some, there's like some true shooting numbers that I'm always looking at. I'm like, is this like, is this real? I don't even, I don't even know what that sure. means, but is it, is it, is it real? And then I'm looking at it going, wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> like I hear people talking about this true shooting. I'm like, man, Mike was a pretty good. I had a pretty good yeah, true shooting percentage. Yeah, I saw that you broke of, a few records while you were yeah, there. So um, it's funny. My 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 one my 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 longest running. Well, I still have one more. I still have one more record left. I still have steals, which I always say. I always say Ed, that you know, in, in my career, I had like twelve steals in my entire career, but I had eight of them in one game. And my <laughs> quote, my quote in the newspaper after that game was, "They just kept passing me the ball." They're like, "How'd you break the steals record?" I'm like, "I don't know." The other team, they just kept passing to me. I don't know funny. what to. I don't know what to tell you. So. That's the only one. I, that's the only one I still have. Last eight, year, they, that's going to be tough to break. Eight, that eight is. steals in one game. Yeah, that's a. It's 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 a lot. Somebody got my ten 
Sincere uh, Carey, who's actually a, a local kid from here, hey, uh, not too far away from yes. me, got 10, hit, hit 10 threes in the game. So I had nine for, I think I set that in 1991, and it lasted until 2021. So 30 years that record stood, which is, which is pretty good. Wow. No, so you're still paying attention to, to what's happening with your alma mater. Huh? I try to. I try to. I try to get back to at least one game a year uh, if I can. Just to, And sometimes I'll go to more, but uh, it, I, I, try to, I try to kind of stay – I kind of try to stay in touch as much as I can. So Awesome. Awesome. You know, um, whenever we have time offline sometime, we'd love to show you what the roster looks like in, in, the plat- in, our, in our platform. But, yeah, it'd be cool. Um, yeah, so hopefully – does that, did that do a good enough yeah, job kind does. of giving you an overview? It does. Okay. United Basketball Plus is your doorway to all things basketball. If you desire to go further, faster as a coach and leader, if you want to maximize your team's potential, or if you simply just want to be a student of basketball, United Basketball Plus is the resource to take you to the next level in your basketball journey. As a member, you will have access to some of the greatest minds in basketball today. The in-depth videos provided by these coaches and basketball experts will help make difficult concepts simple to understand and teach. With your membership, you will have access to video playbooks, sports psychology, fast model playbooks, skill development, speed agility, and various other United Basketball Clinic videos. Your annual membership also includes access to our 2021 United Basketball Clinics, as well as discounts to attend future basketball clinics. The best way to find out all we have to offer is to visit us at unitedbasketballplus.com. So let me me jump in with some questions. Okay. All right, so question one. Obviously, in order for you to be able to get any data, because look, I've been to a lot of AAU tournaments in my life, and (laughs) I've been to AAU tournaments now at all kinds of different levels, so I've been to some that are pretty good. Most recently, my son's going to be a junior, and last year, for the first time, we traveled and went to some of the bigger tournaments, And but previously, we played in lots of different local things, and I can honestly tell you that I don't know that I've ever seen a box score that would have just the straight counting stats that you're talking about in all of your metrics. So the question that I have, or maybe it's not even a question, but it's just more of a statement. Obviously you have to pair with some of the biggest, best run, most functional events around the country so that the statistics that you're getting, first of all, that you're getting them at all. And then secondly, you have to be able to rely on them that they're accurate in order for what you're putting out there to be in any way actually reflective of what the players are doing. So I know you talked about some of the different places that you paired up with, but maybe give them all a little promo, some of the events, and you mentioned flying to the hoop, which we just had. I just interviewed Hortzman just, I don't know, a week or two ago, and so his episode will be coming out. Probably it'll already be out by the time yours comes out, but nonetheless – He's running a great first class event here in Dayton, Ohio. But just talk about how you how you connected with those events, knowing what you needed in order to be able to put this together. Yeah, absolutely. You know, just to clarify one thing you said, you know, I, I think you said, you know, being able to partner with with the best and um, event operators out there. And and I don't want to take away anything from from those, you know, who might think of themselves as the best, but actually the ones that I would say have been the best partners for us as Cerebro, I would say I would use the word like forward thinking. Gotcha. You know, or or those who are willing to in, kind of like invest in the long run of of their events who who see I, I understand that that for a lot of the event operators in the short term they don't get a return on investment in having stats at their at their event you know they sell they sell streaming they yep. sell tickets to the stream and they sell coaches packets you know to the coaches and 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 they make their revenue you know with with the teams coming in so no one's really been able to figure out how to generate revenue off of data off of stats and so until someone figures out how to crack that code which i think we have then there's still not going to be a lot of stats at these events unless they are your your absolute premier forward thinking event operators who like Eric Horseman, you know, just want to put on the best events possible, you know, or Glenn Smith down here in Dallas who does Hoop Fest, you know, like they're going to invest in in having not just like live stats, but even like ha- like they're going to have the stats at halftime for the teams to be able to print out and 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 study, you know, in between games. So 
yes, it's it's always easier when we can work with event operators who already are getting great stats. But what we're willing to come in and do for those event operators who are forward thinking and right now only stream video is, hey, you may not be able to to have it make sense financially to to invest in um, in a live statistician. But what we can do is we can help you coordinate with 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 your video streaming company and then with one of our uh, video breakdown partners. So we have like three different video breakdown companies that we could send. If we have good quality video and, and what you were alluding to earlier, a good score sheet or roster, then we can stat by we can have one of our partners stat by video. And it's not, you know, it's not immediate. And so you won't have that at the end of your son's, you know, game and tournament. But within 48 hours of that event, you know, being finished, if Cerebro was able to 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 get the rosters and, the, and pictures of the score sheets and have access to the video to then turn around to our video partners, then we can get those box stores into our platform usually within 48 hours. So that's, that's kind of like how the sausage is made um, when it comes to if you can't get it live, then this is kind of like your next best option. And I, I think it's kind of a better late than never type situation. And one thing that we're doing, you know, with, let's see, you know, just using um, Eric's event, Flying to the Hoop, you know, they, ha they have, they've had stats, I think every single year, but their streaming partner is SUV TV, um, founded by a great operator named Marcus Burnett. And Marcus is is a partner of Cerebros, and we've been able to 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 take a look at his vast library of a lot of elite events around the country that have never been actually statted. Like a lot of like LeBron James's son, Bronny's James's son's games, um, they've 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 they have film on these. Um, I think the Battle series, but you know they they don't have stats for these games. So we've been able to go back with Marcus collect the rosters, even if it's tedious, like asking the coaches, hey, like who was this kid wearing wearing this number at this game like in like two years ago? You know, to just to be able to make sure that, that kid <laughs> yeah, gets credit for gotcha. what he did on the court. And we would we'll do that retrospectively. Um, and and we'll break down those box scores and and basically have data in our platform that no one else in the world has. Um, which is which is, if you don't mind, kind of like a great transition to how we got Mark Cuban as an investor. All right, jump into that. Go right, go 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 right to it. Sure. Um, it's it's basically one line, or you know, one line that my CEO wrote to Mark Cuban via email right after the NBA draft uh, this past year, when we picked up Jaden Hardy, and Ryan basically emailed Mark and said, "Hey, congratulations on the pickup of Jaden Hardy. I guarantee you, we have data on Jaden Hardy that your front office does not." That was it. That was the email. Mark responded back, make me your best offer. And from there, we just, we went through due diligence. Um, but being able to tell an NBA team that we have data that they don't was pretty much as confident, you know, of a move that our team has ever been able to make um, thus far. So what does that conversation look like? Well, obviously you can say that. And then the next question is, well, what is it? So what, so what is sure. that? I mean, obviously you're going to explain what it is to them, but just what does that conversation look like where, as you talked about 15 minutes ago, I would think that if you had an imposter syndrome talking to Mike Cleansing on the Hoop Heads podcast, <laughs> that if you're going in to talk to Mark Cuban and an NBA front office, that that feeling of that imposter theory probably was okay. was probably a little bit stronger then. So just tell, tell me a little bit about what that conversation looks sure. like sounds like sure and, and and it still was a little bit of imposter syndrome because the truth behind that statement is that it was one game it was one game that when we were a really young company even when we were actually it wasn't even when we were cerebro but we were e-play back then um ryan and our chief data officer john cho they went out to a small little showcase event i think in las vegas and they like we were actually statting games ourselves then. Like I told you that we were, you know, now we use like video partners and whatnot. Right. Like, we, like we actually statted games ourselves. So we, <laughs> that's how we knew that no one else in the world would have this data set. Um, and Jaden Hardy happened to have played one game in this showcase. <laughs> so that's, that's how we got the hook. And, you know, I, I tell you now that like, I mean, we could tell the front offices now that we probably have a lot of data that 
on a lot of players that they're interested in that that they don't have, and that's part of our pitch and our and and why we're trying to sell data licenses to to these NBA teams. But that was that was the hook I think that we needed to to be able to not just tell Mark but tell ourselves like this is we are doing something special here, um, and this data is is not just valuable to an NBA team, but you know what does it mean to to the kid who's trying to who's trying to you know pick trying to show that he deserves to be a D2 player, not a D3, you know, or he deserves to be a D1 player, not a D2, or that he even deserves to play in college. Like just, you know, being able to have your numbers to be able to advocate yourself, it just seems like it's, it, that for some reason, it's just, I mean, not for some reason, like we understand that, like that's never existed in this space. And it's why there is so much confusion and intimidation, I think, for parents and players on the, on that journey of, of being recruited. So that's, that's going to open up a whole other conversation for us, but let me pause there and just see if like, if, if, if that made sense for you, what, you know, what we're doing and, and why like that statement to Mark is really, you know, the hook that allowed us to, to start having traction and credibility um, with the audiences that we we're trying to, to work with. Yeah, it makes sense. So I think my thought process as I first started to look at, what you guys are doing and obviously trying to figure out, well, how do they get what they get from the box score and turn that into something that is going to accurately measure the total value, for lack of a better way of saying it, of a player. So that's the first thing that I think is popping into my head. And then I guess the next question that I would have if I was – Mark Cuban or I was an NBA front office is, okay, have you taken this data? And you talked about it a little bit that if you apply it to NBA players, but in your experience, when you went and you apply this to the NBA and you're looking at the number that comes out, you're looking at your RAM that comes out of, of this, I'm assuming that what you're seeing is that the players who are universally considered to be the top players in the league, that that the ranking system of players corresponds pretty accurately with the number that Absolutely. you guys can produce from from these from these box scores. So to me, that's where if I'm looking at if I'm looking at this, like you could show me a number from some AAU tournament, right? And you could say, hey, Billy Smith from California is the top player in this, you know, in this AAU tournament, I'd be like, okay, well, fine. But what, what does that really show me? But if you show me that the first team, all NBA guys, those are the, those are the top five guys. When we take their previous seasons, box scores, we put these metrics on it. Now that's when I start to get intrigued. So I'm assuming that's the data. I mean, you obviously don't have to share it, but I'm assuming that's the data that you have that you shared with, Mark Cuban and anybody else who's coming to you with, you know, an interest in doing this. I'll be completely honest with you, Mike. Like the NBA teams aren't necessarily interested in our metrics. They want the raw data. They have their own, you know, analytic departments that that are going to, you know, model and forecast, you know, the features. But I can tell you that I'm so proud of the metrics that we do have in the RAM, you know, like you just mentioned, that if you go back into all of the history of the NBA and you look at the different eras, like not only does, you know, what I tell you that the names make sense in the order that they come in. Like the Ram translates even into different eras and playing styles of basketball that like that a Kevin Garnett would be a number one ranked player in one of his years. And Michael Jordan, definitely a number one, but Steph Curry, you know, like um, the way he plays um, and dominates, like it, it, they dominate in different ways, but they still float to the very, very top. And, um, so when we get a chance and we want to do a deeper dive on on just what the how the ramp shakes out like these tiers like I would love to show you that and it even goes side by side with let's just say an NBA kind of like the gold standard at the moment at least for the casual NBA fan would probably be the PER right. and if you take the top 20 players by PER last year next to our t- top 20 by the RAM like I tell you you'd like our list better because the PER inherently favors big men with high, you know, field goal percentages. Like 
it'll it'll put a Hassan Whiteside and a Mitchell Robinson super high up on that list, and they're gonna make that list, and you're gonna kind of scratch your head like, wait, Hassan Whiteside? Like that doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> so I guess you know, no knock on on Hollinger over there, but um, just just to say, we're not saying this number is perfect, but it's it's more than serviceable. And when you you know you can apply it to the NBA set, but imagine applying it to all of Division One. You apply it to all of Division One, and then imagine this, Mike. You have a button in in the corner that says transfer eligible. The players that are in the transfer portal right now. You click that button. I show you the list of players in order of most valuable to least valuable, and that's been a game changer for for our collegiate coaching audience you know two years ago sorry i'm kind of going backwards here from mark from the mark cuban story but when we first kind of like took a product to market in april of 2020 right after march madness we were still like working in google sheets and we had you know these filters set up we had all the division one um men's you know, with our RAM um, rating. And then we added this transfer eligible button. And even though we don't have access to, you know, the portal, you know, we would, we would, we would honestly, we would follow what would happen on verbal commits. So we would track, we would track, you know, which players had entered and which players have left the train. That's the only way we would know. So we would add that information, you know, on a daily basis basis. Um, and when I said we, I specifically John Cho, and I'll tell you more about him in a second, but you you add that button and it just, you know, you just know who to go look into a little bit more and it saved so much time. And that's what we started to sell to, to college coaches was access to this Google sheet for like $50 a month <laughs> just to see if like we were building something that was useful, you know, and you know, sure, it was only for that kind of season of like, you know, when recruiting or, or, or you know, scouting might be a little bit more, um, you know, like hot. But, you know, we, we got a lot of really great feedback that this is, this is, I mean, not just that tool alone, but what we were building was is going to be the future of recruiting. You know, being able to do that with, at you know, at the AAU level and being able to do that across multiple data sets. Um, is something that was gonna gonna change everything. So, um, yeah, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a of a and the audience kind of like an understanding of, of Cerebro's you know little little start and some of the traction we've been able to make since then. You know, we've been able to build out you know an actual web application tool now where you know it's it's self contained and and it's it's really really slick. You can there's a global search that you can search you know around the world. Um, for players and we're adding like data to it so much data to it every single day um uh so that's that's what we're that's what we're up to at the moment okay let me ask you this about the about the metrics so i'm imagining that there's obviously one number that you're comparing across whatever across players across events and if you're talking about the transfer portal, you can compare everybody. You can get that one singular number. But then I'm going to take it one step further that you also have the ability, let's say that I'm a Division One coach and what I'm looking for is I need a big who can block shots and rebound the ball. So now I can look at, okay, here's a player who ranks here, but maybe their strongest metric is – three-point efficiency, and that's not what I'm looking for. But instead, I'm looking for somebody who has a high overall ranking, but I'm also looking for that sub-ranking of the the around-the-rim metric. So I'm guessing that that's also a capability that you have in place that people can look at, okay, what specific type of player am I looking for? And then I can use those sub-metrics to figure that out. Exactly right. You can di- you can use our shortcuts to find archetypes if you want to. You can use the knobs to kind of dial it up, dial stuff up, up and down as you want to. And I'll just even give you a case study from a from an assistant coach who was who was one of our early testers, and he basically gave us the scenario of like, I'm looking for you know, I want I want to see all the big men who are at least six foot eight, 
who play less than 12 minutes and show them show them to me in the order of like you know how many rebounds they how many defensive you know offensive rebounds they grab you know and so we were able to do that within a few clicks and just you know kind of build build that build that form because I only learned that later from him like why why are you looking for you know like people kids, right. like guys who play less than 12 minutes so he was basically looking for you know productive players who weren't getting a lot of playing time and were probably unhappy about their situation and might be willing to transfer so that he could though then go and talk to their high school coach and find out what their situation is and like that's kind of how I learned you know how recruiting like how this stuff happens but um <laughs> You know, it, it then it just made all the sense in the world that yeah, like that's 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 what you, you that's what you need to be paying attention to, and you know, um, when something like that happens. So you know, just you know, this this it's still crazy to me the macro trends that that have shifted the college basketball landscape within the past three four years. You know, that trans that you know COVID, you know, giving players an extra year of eligibility as well as the transfer you know um, rule exception, being able to transfer without without having to sit out a year it just it really just created chaos and free agency marketplace and chaos creates opportunity and i think for us it you know it was actually perfect timing um for our tool to come out and, and get tested because you know for the first time coaches were have this opportunity to look at more players than they ever could and unfortunately the high school players that are incoming are the ones who probably you know suffer the most because sure. of it but you know, for, for the coaches, they're like, wow, how, where do I even begin um, to start researching who I should be looking at? So, you know, the, the coaches that we were able to bring in early on and, and, and give us a try, I think we, we just have heard um, some amazing testimonials, um, you know, even from a D2 coach who just told us like, because of your tool and, and being able to recruit off of the transfer portal, like we're like Cerebro is the reason we made it to the tournament this year. Um, and I don't know, just uh, at least from the coaches coaching perspective, like that brings a lot of a lot of um, validation. Um, but like I said, whenever you're ready, being able to then transition to what this company is doing and why it's doing like why we're doing what we're doing for the players themselves, I think is is really the heart of of my team and um, uh, of of the company. Okay, let me ask you one more question about the coaches. And then, sure. we'll, then we'll skip to the player part of it. So from a coaching standpoint, obviously, when you guys introduce this and it first comes out, nobody knows what it is. You have to educate people <laughs> about it and let them know what's going on and share some of the things that we've already talked about to help them to gain an understanding of what exactly it is that you guys are doing. So who are the first coaches that you reach mm -hmm. out to? I don't, I don't mean you have to name names, sure. but no. just what are the relationships – yeah. that you had or who did you go to to say hey which coaches might be early adopters of this which ones would be open to it just what was the process for figuring out who do we go to in order to be able to put this in the hands of people who we think are going to be able to understand it and then want to utilize it and then once they realize hey this is a good tool now obviously it becomes coaches are talking and it, it grows from there no such a fair question it brings back such amazing memories and visceral moments um you know it's, it's all about relationships and you know who you know and i'll start with coach beeline coach beeline like i said was if not our i think our very first investor in cerebro like he believed in us really really early and so when we had our google sheet tool even in that state he was he was willing to take us he he formed two separate focus groups for us coaches for us to go talk to. There was probably like five or six in each of those uh, Zoom calls of, you know, just his coaching tree, like, you know, just kind of spread throughout the, throughout the country. And, um, you know, if it's okay, I'm not going to name any names at the moment. Um, but that's where we got our earliest feedback. And I still remember, I mean, I don't, I'm trying to think why, would, but we, there's no reason not to, <laughs> but maybe, maybe just, just to be on the safe side, I won't say names. But yeah, that was, makes sense. There was one coach, and I think we were we were looking at a recruit look hoops Omaha data set, and we were looking at you know the players uh, you know in our kind of like in that ranking with the with the Ram, and I was like, okay, here's here's the best three point shooter based off of the three PE metric that was in the 
in the tournament. So we click on his name and then you can look at his player event profile. You scroll down to the to, towards the bottom and then you have his game logs. And so you can see his his you know his numbers by the by each game. Um, and then on but then if you scroll to the right just a little bit, you have two links. One is a link to the actual like box score and then the second one is to the game film. And when he saw the game film, he said, "Oh shit." Like <laughs> this this is going to change recruiting like this is like you mean i can just click that button and i go watch the film on that kid and we're like yeah he's like oh my god um so that moment was definitely um, a light bulb moment for us that we felt like we were onto something and that was still just just the beginning of it and, and just to give you an idea like you know that, that could be a baller tv link that could be a synergy link that's where we as cerebro we're not trying to go and be the video breakdown company like we'll link out to whoever has that film and and if you have a if you have a synergy account and and you you can you want to watch that you know kid every three-point shot he 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 took and you know it's all clipped up for you like that then you if you have that subscription you just click it and you get to go watch that so if you if we don't and we just have like i don't know a youtube video link then you can go and watch the, the full game film and some coaches they want that right they want to they want to see everything and, and look for the the red flags and the body language and how they how they react to misses etc um but it's there like our thing our one of our sayings is start with the stats start with stats like we know that eventually like the the next step is is to go and watch some film and go watch these players in person but like instead of like spending time watching a player that may not be producing as much as you think they are like if you at least start with the numbers you start with a, a you know like if you're looking at a funnel like a wider base and, and a bigger population at the top and then you filter out who you don't need to look at um you know, really quickly with our tools. And then, you know, once you figure out who you want to go spend time evaluating and, and researching, um, then you can go and, and spend your time on that. So we're just trying to save these coaches, you know, time um, from that, that angle. I think the eye test, it's interesting, obviously, as the numbers have become more and more important and we've gotten better quality numbers, you still have a lot of coaches that as you talked about several times, they want to see the player in person. They want to see him with their own eyes. They yeah. want to evaluate and them they should. under that way, which exactly, which they, they definitely should. And yet I think sometimes we know that as coaches, sometimes your perception of things is not necessarily always accurate because sometimes you get stuck sort of in one way of thinking and you oftentimes maybe don't recognize Either it could be the growth in a player or the diminished skills of a player or mm -hmm. the impact of a player. And I think that what's interesting to me is the ability to be able to take these relatively simple numbers and turn them into something that is comparable to other players that you would be competing against, whether that's you're competing with them directly on the floor or – in the direction that we're going to go next where you're a player and you're competing with these other players for opportunity, whether that's opportunity coming out of the transfer portal, whether that's opportunity coming out of high school and the ability to be recruited. I think that's where, again, you're going to tell me here in a second that that's where you see the value lie in getting players access to this data. So why don't we jump off there well, before next. before I do that, if you don't mind, I just wanted to to I forgot you asked me like um, how we got to the coaches that we got to, and so Coach Beeline was you know I think a spark for a gotcha. lot of those coaches. But yep. I'd, I I'd be remiss if I didn't mention and tell you a little bit about at least two of my teammates at Cerebro. So one his his name is John Cho. He's our chief data officer. He worked for the Houston Rockets for 19 years, and he worked his way up from assistant kind of like part-time video equipment person um, to eventually being on the the bench um, on the coaching staff for the Rockets and being Daryl Morey's right-hand guy to take 
the data and the analytics and take it to the coaches and take it to the players. Um, and so, I mean, I've never met anyone with the type of work ethic that John Cho has. It just gave me a glimpse of like what it takes to like, to make it in the, uh, in the NBA. And, um, John has had, I don't know how many interns he's had go through his department, his video department at the Rockets, but it's pretty safe to say that like his network of current assistant and general managers in the NBA is is really really vast, um, and and just folks that he's that that basically owe their first jobs to John, and who are still who are working in the NBA in, in different capacities like. They like John is is beloved um, by by all of these these guys. When whenever we show up, I mean not just whenever, but like this past year of being at summer league in Vegas and being just being able to like hang around hang around John and walk through some of these casinos and, and the and the people that come up to him. It was just for me. It was just um, such a I don't know. Uh, fan fanboy moments i guess like like all you know all of these players and legends like coming up to be like just cho 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 so that's john and so through him we obviously were able to to also have a pretty good start on a network of coaches to go and, and talk to and then um and then another teammate of mine his name is rob james um he he is in a lot of ways the architect of and, and the visionary for a lot of what we're what we're doing here. He used to work for Crossover, and I I don't I didn't know too much about it. I don't know if you would know Mike. Um, but I think there's a we video. had we had Vasu Kolkarni, who uh, was the the CEO, founder? the founder okay. of of, of yes. Crossover, on with us back in go. the back in the early days of the pod. So yes, so okay. I'm familiar with it. Yeah, for sure. So Rob worked support for Vasu for 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 um, Crossover and. He, you know, I mean, he just, he's lived the grassroots basketball space. He's from New York and um, his knowledge and network is, is different from John's, but like is also the grassroots basketball world. And so he knows who to go to, where to go, all the underground, you know, things to do to be able to get into a gym or whatever. And he's in a lot of ways guided um, a lot of our strategy and data collection and just um, shown us the way uh, to go. So between those two guys, I just wanted to at least give give some of my teammates um, a little bit of a shout out. Like I am, like I said, very much an outsider to this world. And, and that's how we've started to, to gain, you know, some some relationships in this space that, that you know, is all based off of relationships and trust and and um, it's just how, how things move here. So anyway, those I just wanted to add that part before we, we go into the players. All right, so jump into the player piece of it. What do you see as being the value add for players and what direction do you see it going in terms of you being able to get this metric into the hands of players and then what players can subsequently do with that information? Sure. I'll be honest with you, this is a big part of what we're trying to solve right now in terms of, I I know it'll be, it's probably impossible to make stats cool to high school basketball players. Um, however, I think that what we've started to realize is when you get the buy-in from event operators and when you get the buy-in of the coach of the high school coaches, when you start to get get the buy in, and then you're going to get the buy in of the parents, you know. And if you have that, um, you know, the players are going to reap the rewards of having their stats and and learning what to do with them um, because of their supporting cast. And so, the current mission at hand for our team, and it's not just current. Actually, this is this is the this is the true mission of of Cerebro, which is to raise to to raise recruiting literacy. Like this phrase is, is something that we've just started to just say a lot in our internally at our company. Just recruiting literacy. Like that's yes, we might be a data company. I think we're a data company that's masquerading as like a, hopefully like a leadership academy. You know, that's that's going to help um, 
these kids and their parents take the data to, to do what you were just saying earlier, like compare, um, you know, to the competition, to those who are, who are, who have some sort of, um, baseline of, of some sort of ranking system to be able to say, Hey, like, you know, I was able to do this against that player who was, who was supposed to be offered by Michigan state. Like, I just went toe to toe with him in this tournament. My my C RAM was actually even a little bit higher than him. Like um, I can take that you know player event breakdown to a coach and start start building myself a resume. So what we're doing with each of these you know small tournaments or weekend tournaments and also scholastic seasons is you know each data set that we get in there, we're going to be able to generate like an individual player event report. And that's something that, you know, your son playing in a tournament, you know, over the weekend, like you said, like you, you don't even know when the last time was that he had, you know, a piece of paper with his stats from from the event. And what we want to do is we want to provide you that. We're going to sell it to you for $25, which we think is a really, you know, accessible and affordable and valuable, you know, like hopefully a very accessible price point. And you can you can stack those up, you know, you know, any event that you go to that's Cerebro certified, it's going to have, you're going to be able to like purchase one at. So one, we want you to go play at Cerebro certified events, you know, with, with our partners and the ones who are forward thinking, the ones who are investing into stats. Like if you're, there's going to come, come a point in time when if you're not playing at a Cerebro tournament or if a, if a tournament's not Cerebro certified, like why are you playing in that tournament? Like that's, that's a tipping point we believe as a company is, is, is going to come. So anyway, that being said, um, for now, you know, we'll, we'll go one-offs, you know, with these event events and you can go in and purchase these play event reports for $25 a piece. But eventually we want a subscription so that, Hey, you know, just for however much a month, like you're, it doesn't matter. You're just gonna have access to everything that you play in. And in addition to that, we're going to provide you resources and tools and education and curriculum to guide you, you know, on your recruiting process. No matter if you're just trying to make it, you find a way to play in college and keep your dream alive, or if you're being recruited by, by you know, by the Blue Blood programs. Like we can still provide value for those players who are evaluated between Duke and Kentucky and you know Michigan. Like because we can show you their rosters with our metrics and tell you. This is how you would fit. Like this is this is who they're going to lose next year. This is who they're looking at. This is probably like where you would come in. You know, it's for us it's about fit. We want we would just want players to go to where they they belong and are going to thrive and you know, it, it's in some ways a matchmaking surface um for coaches and and players and it might not be perfect, but hopefully if if everyone's using and speaking this language that Cerebro is is building then then it's at least better than what it is today and you know we can start minimizing a lot of you know the um i don't know i know there's a lot of um negative things that we don't have to go into that happen around recruiting and and players not going to where they probably should and 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 you know a lot of money involved in 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 decision making processes etc but being able to at least have the data um to and 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 the resources to um in, have a more informed um, uh, process to to going on this journey and supplying that to you know as many people that want to learn as possible. Like we really hope that high school coaches. You know, I'm going to be talking to a lot of high school coaches here in Dallas over the next few weeks after one of our local event operators is going to put on an event and we're going to go take their their kids' data to them and say, hey, if you're helping this kid try to get recruited, like, do you have these numbers for them? Um, you know, this is how to look at it. This is how to help, you know, your kids, you know, who might not be looking at like, yes, your top two might be going to D1, but like, hey, your third and fourth guys might be able to go play D2. Like this is, let's, let's help them out. This is how you can help them and want to put those resources and tools into, into the coach's hands too. Is this making sense? It is. Your first impression is everything when applying for a new coaching job. A professional coaching portfolio is the tool that highlights your coaching achievements and philosophies, and most of all, helps separate you and your abilities from the other applicants. The Coaching Portfolio Guide is an instructional membership-based website that helps you develop a personalized portfolio. 
Each section of the Portfolio Guide provides detailed instructions on how to organize your portfolio in a professional manner. The guide also provides sample documents for each section of your portfolio that you can copy, modify, and add to your personal portfolio. As a Hoopheads Pod listener, you can get your Coaching Portfolio Guide for just $25. Visit coachingportfolioguide.com slash hoopheads to learn more. Do you see the bigger challenge as you guys look ahead down the road? Is it a bigger challenge to educate the event operators, the high school players, or the high school coaches? Like, Which of those three groups do you think is going to be easier to crack in terms of getting them to adopt and see the value in providing these kinds of stats? That's a great question. And um, it's something that I don't think we've solved yet. And I don't know if I could tell you which, which de- I think I could tell you which demographic is the hardest out of those three. If it's talking about the event operators, the high school coaches and the players themselves, I think the players themselves are the hardest to, uh, to show the value to. I mean, I think we've, we've been on the ground, you know, at a number of events and it, maybe it's just the timing and the environment. Like that's not the time to, to talk <laughs> to the kids and the Do you think players. it's parents? I mean, do you think they have to get to the parents of those kids? I think the parents get it really quickly and they see the value. Um, I think it's, I think it, it, it matters when and how we deliver it to them. And that's why we're, yes, we want to, if we can speak to the players, uh, sorry, if we can speak to the parents, um, directly like i think that would be an amazing way to be able to educate people about what cerebro is doing and our metric etc what our current i think working theory is is that if you get the event operator to buy in to 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 get the data into the platform and then not only that but when we produce these when we produce you know the the data set in our platform for your event you have like leaderboards, you know, based off of what, you know, you can sort by whatever um, like stat you want to, if you want to do, you know, points or rebounds or assists, if you want to do that to those type of leaderboards, you can, you have the content right there. If you want to use our metrics, you can make those. And we'll, we're, we're even partnering with these event operators to create these leaderboard graphics for them so that they can tweet those out so that their, their audience, you know, their coaches and parents and players will see those and see the the exposure and the value of having those numbers for their events. So this brings their events um, more value and exposure when it's in Cerebro's platform, because we can also tell you college coaches are looking at, you know, your, your events or looking at your players. Um, so then the, the hope is that the parents who truly do drive a lot of the decision making in the grassroots basketball space, whether it's for the kids or for the for the event operators, if you're not making the parents happy, they're just going to take their kid and go to a different different tournament or different circuit. Like you do need to make your parents ha- happy. Um, so that's we're we're trying to be as you know so we're kind of come into these event operators and work with them as much as possible. But you know. I'd be lying if I told you, Mike, that like they're getting it. <laughs> um, right. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we're just we're we're we feel like we're the rising tide that's going to lift all boats in in this in this basketball space. And those who don't get with it sooner rather than later, like, I don't want it to happen. But you know, it's they're going to be scrambling. They're going to be scrambling later to like figure out how to get stats at their events, and their parents are going to be asking them like why why are, are my kids stats not in cerebro and you know they're gonna have to come back to us and say please can you help us figure out a way to get our stats into your system can you figure out a way to help us get stats and you know i mean we are definitely here to to help anyone who wants to help themselves um, and run better events um, because at the end of the day it's it's for it's for the kids to be able to have you know something tangible to to you know some sort of record of like what they did on the court. Like I want to be able to tell every player, like I want, I think every coach wants to be able to tell their players, like every play matters. Like you can, you can go out there and leave it all out on the court because someone somewhere is going to have some way to like record that 
and give you credit for it. Um, like that's, that's, I think, what we are bringing to this space. I can totally see the value in it, Ed, when I start thinking about my own kids experience and just the ability, even if let's take it a step further, even if it's not a recruiting tool for a kid, even if it's not something that they're going to utilize to further their basketball career, I know that in talking to kids that oftentimes you'll have a game end and the kids will know exactly how many points they scored <laughs> or how many rebounds they got or how many assists they had or maybe they're fabricating it, but they, they try to keep track of that stuff. And so just to be able to have that on hand so that whatever, a day later, two days later, after it goes through your entire process, to be able to have those statistics and have something tangible to be able to look at, I mean, I can totally see where a kid would find value in that. And again, that's completely separate from well, well, no, the value, I, mean, I think right? I think you are you're spot on. And you know, the phrase that I said earlier, basketball tools for basketball people. That's what my that's what my teammate PD likes to say. Like, I mean, it's hard to really, I, we don't want to call ourselves a data company. That's not fun. Right. But like, we're 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 basketball tools for basketball people. And you, a, you know, a dad, a Division One player. Like, I'm sure. There's a level of coaching that you might provide to your son, and even if he has his own trainers and, and coaches, like to be able to look at his development over time, like yep. you know, from event to event, and just to be able to like, you know, either work with him directly or tell his trainer, like, man, like, what's going on here? Like three point shooting, like it's it's uh, whatever it is, you know, like you you can you can speak to that a lot better than I can, but like having the data to be able to essentially go through this like cycle this cycle of play measure learn play measure learn play measure learn play measure learn like that's that's what having data allows you to do you know even for your kid um and what every kid should be able to have so that's just one of the like you're saying auxiliary like impacts of having data aside from just the recruit like yes recruiting literacy it kind of like is our you know f- kind of flag that we're kind of planting that like this is where we're going to to change the game, but everything else around it, even like when it comes to coaching and scouting and player development, you know, are things that having data and metrics are going to allow you to do. So anyway, I think you already, you know, I just, I love that it's already making sense for you and that you're thinking about the other th- ways that you can use data because I couldn't tell you, like, I think people are going to come up with ways to use Cerebro in ways that I still, I have no idea like what people are going to do with this. Um, but there is so much that's going to be possible, you know, when you start thinking about like just translating um, like players that are just the global movement of players, these, you know, like how international this game is. And, and you want to talk about like how, how good is the Euro league? How good is like the NBL? How good are, how good is the China basketball league? If you can start seeing players and, and, and their C ramps, and, and how good is an NCAA Division One player? Go into the NBA and let's see what the what the fall off is in that first year and the second year for 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 you know a Division One you know let's say a Trey Young going right. in, into the first year of you know Atlanta Hawks versus Luka Doncic coming in from Euroleague like okay they both dropped some you know both dropped a little bit in their C ram um, from their respective or you know previous leagues but Luka's drop was much less than Trey's. And then their second year, which you know a lot of NBA players make a huge jump going from their first year to second year. Luca's, I mean, both of them made make significant jumps, but Luca gets back to pretty much where he was in the Euroleague, like within within two years in the NBA. And you know, Trey still, I mean, he kind of lands in this maybe into the silver or bronze bronze area. Um, so anyway, so then you have like just a whole other application of having you know uh, Cerebro. Cerebro's metrics, and we haven't even talked about NIL or gambling dollars, et cetera. Like we don't even need to, but because, like I said, that really at the at the heart of it, like we think that this is just going to. We just want for the kids. It's going to. Um, it's going to bring a lot of transparency into um, the recruiting process that hasn't been there. So, um, could you could you compare? 
the quality of events or the quality of leagues, for example. So like if you're looking at yes, sir. the leagues in Europe where you're saying, okay, here's a player who's doing X in the Italian league versus this guy's doing X in the French A league. Absolutely. Now, which one of those two leagues? Or take it back here to AAU tournament. So now I'm an event operator, right? And I'm saying that my event gets the best, whatever. We have the best teams from these five states in the Midwest or we're the best tournament in California. I would think that at some point now there'd be a way to take and measure, okay, this player did this in this tournament, but then in this tournament they're doing that. And I would think over time, again, you could build a data set where you could be able to, as an event operator, say, hey, we're the we're the number one rated event by Cerebro in California or whatever it might be. Yeah, I mean, I think something along those lines that we're doing is to provide like like league context data, you know, yeah, like be able right. to give you like the average like pace and, right. yep. you know, play. I mean, different play styles for sure are going to come out in different leagues. But yes, you start to be able to make some conclusions, um, but, you know, it definitely is still with a grain of salt. Um, you have to... Yeah, I think look at the context and there's specific events that allow you to to see the intersection of different basketball worlds colliding at once that are really then great to then take back to, you know, look at a different set and, and, and be able to say, okay, hey, let's look at FIBA Americas. You know, let's look at these FIBA sets where you have different countries coming in and you can start to to see, you know, players from different leagues and how they're stacking up against each other and you can start to you can also start to see movement you know if you're looking at the nbl and you're looking at hey you know jack landale you know top three c ram and all of nbl comes over to the san antonio spurs like starts playing well you know where lamella ball you know uh number nine c ram in nbl um, in his year before he came over to um the NBA, Bryce Cotton down there. And then you can look at EuroLeague and you have a whole bunch of ex NBA players and they're all sitting at the top of EuroLeague, which is really cool to see like all these names that I recognize as a casual NBA fan. And I'm like, man, I know, I know like 30 of those players. Right. Or, or I'll look at a 2018, 2017 Nike EYBL data set and out of the top 25 C RAM players, like five of them go to Duke. I'm like, okay, like, that's, that's, <laughs> That, that that makes sense and you see everywhere else like that those players end up in the NBA like there's something to it you know so um, those it starts to get really fun uh, once once you say, get start getting comfortable speaking you know our language and it's really good stuff it's fascinating and I think about just what this data a can already tell you and as you continue to build out your data sets with grassroots basketball and obviously you already have it going pretty strong with division one basketball but the ability to be able to evaluate players across different events and to be able to compare players from different teams and to be able to rank them and just take all that and put it in a metric where you're getting that from a basic box score where we know that what NBA teams are doing with the data that they have and the way they're slicing and dicing it and different things. But your ability to take that and simplify it and put it in one number and then have those numbers accurately reflect what people are seeing in terms of the eye test and consensus and what people are looking at in terms of players. To me, uh, it's just the value of this to all the different constituencies that we've talked about just makes a ton of a ton of sense. So we have blown past an hour and a half, <laughs> which is which is great, which is tremendous. What Cut I want to do, 20. I want to make I want to make sure I want to make sure before we get out that you get a chance to share how people can find out more about Cerebro for all our coaches who are out there who are listening who may be interested, players, parents, anybody who's out there, how do they find out more about it? How do they reach out to you, get connected to you so that they can learn more about this? And then after you do that, whether you want to share social media, yeah, easy for me to say, social media, website, email, whatever you want, go ahead. And then after you do that, I'll jump back in and wrap things up. Sure. Um, well, I'll just throw out my personal email. Um, it's ed at cerebrosports.com. I'll even throw out my phone number. Feel free to text me, call me, because honestly, I'm just, I'm still learning so much. And I think, yeah, I'm, whoever has a question, 
if I can help in any way, please don't hesitate to reach out. My number is 678-386-8646. I'm not scared because I already get enough spam, so don't be afraid <laughs> to call or text me. Um, and you can find what, you know, you can see a lot of what we're up to on our Twitter. Um, we have, uh, yes, I think just Cerebro Sports is our handle. Um, that's probably where we're most active in terms of uh, social media. Um, and I think the last thing that I just want to say before we wrap up is one big gap in our company right now, and it's, it is, is girls data, but we're coming for it and it's, it's, we're adding it. Um, as fast as we can. We're trying to get there, um, but we cannot wait to provide more data on the girls' side of basketball. Like That is a huge mission of our team, even though we're all dudes at the moment. We hope that changes very, very soon. Um, but yeah, we cannot wait to get, get more girls' data into our platform. Yeah, and I think as you make inroads with the boys, oftentimes a lot of the same operators and people that are running – events on the boys side a lot of them are running events on the girls side you have some really well run events on the girls side where i'm sure that as you guys continue to build out what you're doing with the boys i'm sure the girls is only a matter of time so ed this has been a lot of fun for me honestly we talked for whatever an hour and 45 (laughs) minutes plus however much we talked before we even started recording and it's uh the conversation to me is fascinating i think the analytics side of it and the statistics always to me are fun to look at and be able to see those numbers and then see how they correlate with things that you look at with your eyes and just where players rank and statistics and just how it, it, to me, it's all, it's all fascinating stuff that as I'm having the conversation with you, my mind's going a million different directions of, of ways that the data can be used and just what you guys have been able to build. And to me, it's, I I think it's a no brainer in terms of boiling it down to something that can be as accurate and have the, the, just the data that you guys have, uh, the value in it is tremendous. And I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your schedule to, to jump on and to join us. And I'm really glad just, I'm really glad Justin connected us. And uh, (laughs) again, I'm looking forward to seeing where you guys take this thing in the future. No, it was an honor for me to be honest, you know, in researching, getting ready, you know, just to listen to the previous podcast you had Munch on. And I was like, I, I'm going to be on the same podcast as Munch. Like, Tantra, are you kidding me? Like, I listened to that entire podcast, just blown away. We're going to buy that book, you know, do a book club for our whole team at Cerebral it's Sports. An, it's awesome. That book is, I, he, I just got it on the, what is it, today's the 28th. So I got it back on, I think, the 23rd and, and read through it. And yeah, I mean, there's just, there's a ton of power in what Munch put out there for sure. So Yeah. No, thank you for having me. Absolutely. We are thrilled that we had an opportunity to have you on and get a chance to learn about what you've done in your career and what Cerebro Sports is doing and will continue to do. And to everyone out there, thanks for listening, and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.